Okay, I just turned the recording on and is your oh I see you. Okay, so this is Krista. Wave everybody, wave at uh, everybody. Hi. This is um, she's my um, awesome rock star paralegal. So um, I'm doing this honestly just to help me also because we have a new um, paralegal. So it'll help onboard her as well to kind of have this sort of outline of how I get ready for trial. Um, and then for future people, if I hire anybody in the future. So we've got the itinerary. So we'll just kind of, you know, dive right in. So what I what I start with is a task list. So the most important thing is not where you put the task list, but that you have one. Um, and this is what mine looks like. Can everyone see this colorful, colorful board? Okay, so I use monday.com to do it. And so the first step is to create a step of absolutely everything that you need to do in order to get ready for trial. So obviously I'm family law, so this is gonna be a family law trial prep board. But this is what it this is what it is for what I need to do to get ready for a, a temporary hearing or a trial that involves children. These are all of the steps from soup to nuts, everything that I need to do, every single step. So the first step is to write everything down and then get it in a task list that makes sense to you. So this is the task list that I use that makes sense to me. So as you can see, it's I can sort by category. So that just makes it easy when I'm preparing for trial, I just go into my list and I just start knocking things off one by one. So, you know, I, I did this mostly because people say, how do I prepare for trial in like two or three hours? And that's really all it takes. And it's because I have these kind of systems. So I would just take a block of tasks and just go through it, you know, verify the other party received notice. Is there a, a real nice side, which is a hearing notice, um, setting the pre-trial meeting with the client, which is a Zoom meeting. Do I discuss the takedown fee? Essentially, every single step that you do in a trial or preparing for trial should be on this list. And when I complete it, it's going to be one of these two these tasks. Either it's awaiting Krista or me, or maybe the client has to do something, or I'm working on it, or I don't need it. Um, send PF request means we have to send a request to the client uh, via pipe file. So at a glance, I would be able to see what the status of everything is. And this is a trial that I just did, which was July 6th, where you can see we just kind of, we went down, we knocked everything out and the, the case was prepped, um, you know, three days before the trial and everything was marked as done. So once I do that, I archive the entire, um, I archive the entire board. So I kind of have this cheat button here that when something is done, I just hit done. I can click multiple and hit done if I need to. Um, but the benefit of this is I can just see at a glance what is done and what isn't. So I'm just gonna kind of assign random things. And then I can sort by that. So that way, if there are tasks that are assigned to me, I can easily sort or I can just filter out and see what things are waiting for me. She can do the same things for things that are waiting for her. Um, and then we can see when it's updated and when it was completed. So once I go through this entire chart, that means my entire case is prepped. So for every single case, no matter what, I always use this chart because if I don't, I'm inevitably going to forget something. So it's just really critical to have just some sort of task list where you can kind of go through. And I kind of like to share it with my clients too. I can export this into Excel. Um, just so they kind of get a sense of what we're doing in order to prepare. Um, I think that's about it. Krista, you want to weigh in on any anything about the task list or? Not that portion now. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, create a task list, obviously do the tasks on your list, and then you'll be prepared for trial every single time. Um, okay, so then my next step is gathering evidence. And how do I do that? So obviously in a civil case, you're gonna have evidence coming in from multiple streams, just kind of all over the place, just kind of vomited on you. So you're gonna have discovery from opposing, um, the opposing party, opposing counsel. You're gonna have stuff that your client gives you. You're gonna have stuff that your client is uploading to your portal. You're gonna have emails. You're gonna have a whole bunch of stuff. So what I do is I just kind of put everything in a folder that's it's called trial prep. So if you get something from your client that you know, if this case goes to trial, that's gonna be exhibit, it's gonna be an exhibit, 
um, to make it easy on yourself, just go ahead and put it in the folder ahead of time so you don't have to go scrounge and look for it later. So this is a, actually I need to do this first. Okay. So this is an example of one of those folders. So I had an emergency hearing and this is something that I actually did prep in an hour because I requested an emergency hearing on Wednesday and I got the hearing and it was scheduled for 24 hours later. So there was not a lot of time to prepare. So I went through the file and just started shoving things into this folder and then I'll go in and I'll organize them later. So that's what I did. I just kind of shoved everything into this folder. I knew it was gonna be an exhibit and then we kind of go through it later on. And then that is actually some, that's something that I delegate to Krista as well sometimes when I'm preparing for trial or preparing for a hearing. So she knows what the hearing is about. So she knows what evidence I need to prove my case at the hearing. So she'll go through you know, all this, the documents that we have and just start adding things to the folder. And from there, what we do is um, we just kind of, I put it in the order that makes sense to me. So in Georgia, we are allowed to call the other side for cross-examination first. So if I'm the plaintiff, I'm almost always calling the other side first. So that, um, that just kind of guides how I organize things because if I'm calling the other side first, then the documents that are related to, the, you know, what I'm gonna ask them questions about are probably are gonna be grouped together and they're gonna be, you know, in the first 10 exhibits or so. If I pre-number everything, once I put a number on there, it's not coming off. So um, usually I can, I can group everything together, but I also don't mind if it's sort of out of sequence because a lot of times before a trial, you get things at the last minute, the opposing counsel is giving you things at the last minute. They've given you things in their evidence packet that you wanna use. I just shove them at the end and keep it moving. Um, and when I have my exhibit list, which I'll show you in a second, it just makes it easy, um, even if it's not in numerical order for to put it in in order that makes sense where I kind of clump all of the issues together. So this is, this is the initial dump file that I got where everything um, was sort of dumped here and then I renamed it. So I rename exhibits in a way that actually makes sense. So for example, this is all the text messages between my client and her husband from February of 2020 until June of 2021. And then I try to get as specific as possible. This is a June 2021 message regarding child support. So if you have you know, 10 exhibits and they're all June 2021 email, it, you're going to have to open the email and look at it to see what's in it. So always name it what it is. And this is the exhibit list that I give to opposing counsel, I give to the judge, and it helps them as well because if the judge has to take the case under advisement and they're looking for in a particular exhibit, if your exhibit has a very, very specific name, it's going to make it a lot easier for them to find. So that's what I do. And I pre-number them. I put the, the very specific number and I add the uh, exhibit number to it. Let me pick a different exhibit than that. So I'll open, I'm trying to find something that wouldn't have private information on it. Let's just go with this. Okay, can everyone see this um, text message? Nope, no. okay. So let me share my whole screen then. Screen three. Okay, so now can you see a text message? Okay. So as you can see, uh, this is this is exhibit 4A, page one, and all of my exhibits have these digital exhibit stickers on the top, and they are super, super easy to do. You can create a footer, and I'm just going to replace the existing. And I use Kofax to do this, but Adobe does it, any PDF software you have can do this and it's really easy so in this case i have this is my plaintiff's exhibit um template so all i have to do for each exhibit is just enter the number and hit enter and that's it so it automatically enters the exhibit plus the page number which is very helpful when you have really really long exhibits because um, it makes it easier to reference them also a lot of our judges like to print out the exhibits 
ahead of time. So when you're sending like a 20 page exhibit, if, you know, something else gets sent to the printer at the same time and it gets out of order, it's really a pain in the behind for them to go back to the Dropbox and try to figure out in what order your exhibits are. So I think everybody should not only put your exhibit number, but number every single page of each exhibit and the judges will not hate you. Um, so that's something that we do in the process that takes about five minutes to do to add the exhibits. Um, so the first thing that we do is I just number them. And then once they're numbered here in my folder, then I just open it up and add the, add the exhibit sticker to it. All right, what is the next thing that I do? Okay, does anyone have any questions so far? I've not been checking the chat. Okay, good, no questions. Um, so the next thing I do for trial prep are order preparation. So Krista does that a lot as well. So I don't go into any order without a final prepared order. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, it keeps me on track when I am trying to you know, present my case to the court. I want to make sure that I've covered everything I need to cover. I send it to my client ahead of time, and that is for a whole bunch of reasons, including CYA, so that they get a copy of what I'm planning to ask for in the hearing and to make sure that they're okay with the requested relief. Um, so a lot of times, I think a lot of people are just going to hearings, the judge makes a ruling, you're just kind of getting an order together and they're sending it out and not really getting their client's approval. And I, I don't like to do it that way. I prefer to get my client's approval ahead of time, and then that way when the hearing is over, you know, most times the judge's order isn't going to match exactly what I've drafted, but I just have to make a couple of tweaks. I can send it to my client and get it out to the judge right away. So that is important for, honestly, for just more client attorney relations that they can see how hard you're working on the case. Um, they can see that what you're asking for matches the evidence. Sometimes it, it just reading the order sort of triggers something in their mind like, oh, I forgot to ask where I went, you know, custody of our dog or whatever. Um, it just gives them an opportunity to sort of weigh in and make sure that you haven't missed anything that you're, af that you're asking for. So, Krista drafts the orders. How long do you think it takes you to, Krista, to draft, like, let's say it's a divorce with children, so you have to do a parenting plan, child support worksheet, child support addendum, settlement agreement, final order, decree. How long does it take you to draft all that? Um, maybe two hours, depending on how complex it is. Sometimes if the settlement agreement has a lot of businesses or rental property or any other issues like that, that may take additional time, but generally it's around an hour and a half to two hours, I would say. Okay. And it usually takes me about 15 minutes to review. It's really, really quick. So, um, and I usually just give her like three sentences, like draft all this stuff and just kind of give her a broad, you know, overview. And then based on what we've done in the past, she kind of knows how to draft it. Sometime I'll have notes and I'll say, no, change this, change this. But in general, I probably spend about 15 to 30 minutes. It's not a really long time just editing those orders. We get it to the client, we upload it to the portal, and then, you know, it's ready to go. And let's see, what is the next step? So I've talked about how I arrange my exhibits by topic. Another thing that I do is if you have a case with a lot of text messages, um, I'm trying to find my text message log. I found this to be really helpful in a case that I just did. There were something like 360 pages of text, um, which was a lot. <laughs> and I kind of wanted to sort of synthesize the material so I could get it in very, very, very quickly. So what I did is um, I had my client export all the text messages to a PDF and with iPhone, you use iMazing. With Android, I can't remember, but there's tons of apps that you can do it. You have them export all the messages um, with PDF. Then I have Krista <laughs> go through those messages um, and she kind of highlights all the ones that are important and what they are relevant to. And I'll show you what that looks like. So this is what I use. And again, this was for an emergency hearing. So we slapped this together in 24 hours. Um, hold on to let people into the waiting from the waiting area. Okay, so you can see how long this is. It was it was a lot. So these are a lot of messages that we kind of had to go through. And I grouped them based on the category. So once you get them all in here and she assigned a topic, a topic to it, um, for example, this was about alcohol use. And these text messages were about child support. And these were about harassment. And these were about um, contacting children. These were about co-parenting. 
once I get them all in here, you know, it's an Excel spreadsheet, so I can just sort by the topic. So I can go to I sort and data and the initial column, I, I sort by, you know, what the category is. And then the next level, um, I sort by the exhibit page number. So that makes it really, really easy. So when I had him on cross-examination and I wanted to talk to him about alcohol, all of the text messages about alcohol are here and I could just go right to the page of this 360 page document in order to quickly go to the text message that I needed to get to. Um, and by the way, we did this hearing in, I wanna say two hours. So I had 11 exhibits, the other side had 10, three people testified and I did it in two hours. And part of that was because, you know, I have a chart like this where I can very quickly go to the page that I need in order to get the document into evidence. Okay, what is next? I talked about adding numbers, exhibit list. So we'll go to my exhibit list. Okay, someone asked, when you do the Excel spreadsheet regarding the text messages, do you give that to the judge along with the actual text? In this case, I did not. I was doing it to just help me during, it helped me ask questions to the other side without, you know, scrambling and looking through the text messages. But you can. So in Georgia, and I'm sure in most states, you have a discovery rule that allows for summaries. So as long as you're introducing the actual documents that into evidence, you can do a summary. And I, I do do those sometimes. I just did, did not in this case, um, honestly, because my client had some not so great texts on the other side, just didn't bother to read them. But, um, but you can do it that way. And as long as you, you know, conform with the rules and in, in my state, there's actually no requirement that you give the summary to them ahead of time, but I still do as kind of a fairness thing. I think they should be able to compare my summary to the actual exhibit to make sure that it, act it actually reflects what's in the, you know, voluminous document. So I, if I was going to do that, I would probably give that to them, you know, a week in advance. In this case, it was an emergency hearing and they got it 24 hours before. So yeah, that's just as good as it was going to get there. Um, all right. So this is my exhibit list. A um, couple on here. So this is a case that I did a week ago, which was a contempt case. So I just put my exhibits in here. This is actually, these my exhibits are theirs. These are mine. Um, I put in what type of document it is. Again, I have a super descriptive title. What type of document it is, the issue that it relates to, if there's a second issue, it's in there, and then whether or not it's admitted, these are the choices, admitted, admitted via stipulation, admitted over objection, withdrawn, denied. Um, the objectives for their exhibit. So I actually put in the other attorney's exhibits as well. So for example, this is a case I did. This is the other side's exhibits, and this attorney actually forgot to admit the majority of his exhibits, which were awesome, because um, some of them would have hurt my client. Um, but if there's something that I know that I'm going to object to, I just change this to object. So when, you know, they're going to introduce that exhibit, I, it obviously cues me to object to it. If there's a reason, obviously I have to have a basis, but if there's some sort of, you know, code section that someone might not be familiar with, I'll just put the link here. Um, so if there's something specific to the objection that needs further explanation, I put it in this column over here just to make it, you know, really easy to get to. So as I go through the case, if Chris is watching, she'll, you know, admit exhibits on this chart for me just to kind of keep it straight or I'll do it myself. Um, it's pretty easy. I just click the admitted button and it shows up as admitted. Um, I export this as an Excel spreadsheet and I send it to everybody. I send it to opposing counsel. I send it to the judge. I send it to the court reporter and I send it to the client. So everybody has a copy of this list. I don't include the notes in the you know, what my um, statutory basis is for admitting a document or objecting to it. I don't, I don't give them that part, um, but I do at least give them the list. And I think judges find it really helpful because they have the list that's very descriptive of the, doc of the documents that they're getting. And um, sometimes they print it out and they just manually check admit or deny instead of them having to write out exactly what it is. So it's just kind of, kind of a convenience thing. Um, 
what is next. So the exhibit list does not take very long to do because as you've seen in my folder structure, I've already numbered and named the exhibit. So the only thing I'm doing is highlighting it, copying and pasting into to the ex exhibit list. Um, and that's it. So that takes I don't know, three minutes to create my exhibit list. So that is a super quick part of the process. Um, then I send it to opposing counsel, court via Dropbox. I just send them a link and I do that instead of email because obviously the link never changes. So there's other things I need to add to it. I just can upload it to the link and the link never changes and they can just download it um, as they want to. Um, so the client prep is actually in my PowerPoint. So I'll, I'll skip over that for now and I'll go to how I present my exhibits. So someone has a question. How long did it take you to build those boards? Um, not that long. I probably have like 50 or 60 boards and I have something specific for everything. I could do a whole webinar just on monday.com. The exhibit board was easy because I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew I knew that I need the name of the exhibit. I know that I needed the type, the issue. Monday makes it really easy. Um, so this board probably took about 10 minutes to create and all of my boards are actually in the section in the file section of the lawyer on the beach group. So if you go to Monday, the monday.com folder, you can just if you're using Monday, you can just drag and drop it into your own Monday account. So I do have automations on there, which are not going to automatically transfer, but automations are pretty easy to build. So this is an easy one when the admitted buttons click, then, you know, change it to admit it. Um, so if anyone's using Monday and isn't quite sure how to build, oh yeah, the Monday webinar is going to take forever, kids. <laughs> um, so if anyone is using Monday or struggling with it, there are people on Fiverr that are experts and they will change your whole life for like a hundred dollars. <laughs> you can just tell them, this is what I want. I want you to do this and they'll just do it. And it's not a lot of money. They can do it super, super quickly. And once it's up and running, it is, it's just incredibly intuitive and easy to do. I personally like building this stuff out, which is why I do it. If I did not like it, I would not do it myself. And I definitely would throw some money at the problem. Um, so yeah, at some point I'll probably will do a uh, Monday webinar. So I will show you how I prepare the exhibits. So in this case, I represented mom. These are all the final exhibits that I use. And as you can see, um, you can see a folder list, correct? Okay, great. So I've labeled plaintiffs one through 12. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of crap up here, which is not exhibits, and this is why. So this is a visual opening statement. Um, I like to have visual opening that just sort of shows the judge it is, what it is that I want. Um, this is probably a child support worksheet from the other side. Um, my financial affidavit, which is a pleading, but I wanna have it with easy access, and I'll show you how I, do, how I did that. And this is an affidavit for my client. So what I do is I highlight all of these and I create a PDF portfolio. And that PDF portfolio looks like this. Let's see. It's gonna take a second to open because it has that 360 page document in there. So I like to combine all of the all the documents that I need easy access to into one PDF portfolio because it makes it a lot easier to to go through each exhibit um, as you're crossing someone or on direct or even an opening or closing. Oh my gosh, it's taking forever. All right, I'm going to close that and then I'm going to have to restart it. Okay, 
so this is a PDF portfolio and this one says all exhibits except for because I wanted to have a smaller one that didn't include that ginormous exhibit. So why I like Foxit for reading is because I can hit detail and I can sort by name and it just shows up like this. And it's super, super, super easy to view. So when I get ready to share my screen for you know trial, this is what it looks like. So I start with my opening statement. This is what I want. Um, so it just makes it easy to kind of put in the judge's face what exactly it is that I want. And as I'm talking about different things in my opening, I can easily get to it without clicking off screen and resharing again. It's just, it's a, it's a lot of time. So I've seen people honestly spend a lot of time if they've got a Dropbox account, they just go to Dropbox and they're just opening each file individually. And you know, if you're pressed for time, it really sort of eats into your time. So this makes it really quick. So this is my opening. I can easily click through. These are orders. Um, this is um, email. And these are all my exhibits over here. So as I'm going through cross-examination, it's super easy to say, do you recognize you know, plans exhibit three? Do you recognize plans exhibit four? Do you recognize plans exhibit five? Do you recognize plans exhibit six? Yes, great. I like to admit one through six. And that's how quickly I get my exhibits. It's, it's a super, super quick process. Um, Sometimes I will put case law in here as well. Um, I'll show you another one where I've got case law in it. So when I'm doing a closing argument, it, again, so I don't have to click away from the screen and the judge is just looking at the screen the entire time, I just include everything in that um, one portfolio so I don't ever have to click off in the either. Okay, so this is another example of another trial that I did recently. So I've got the case law on here um, that's highlighted. So as I'm going through my opening statement, it's super easy to kind of just show that. And I just click through and go through all of my case law. Same thing with the exhibits. Um, this case, we were arguing about what actually something said. <laughs> so I, I kind of cut one portion out of the settlement agreement and just sort of blew it up. Um, refer to it multiple times during the during the trial um, and it just kind of helped to have it sort of in everybody's face and I did a visual opening for this one as well but it's a little bit longer to kind of show you know this is count one this is what they're asking this is our defense same thing with count two this is what they're asking this is our defense and there was none because he owed the money um, this is count three. This is what they're asking for. This is our defense. So it just it made it really easy an opening statement to show look judge. This is why we're here. This is why we're being sued. These are these are our response to this particular issue and just to kind of go through it issue by issue and just made it, I think, pretty easy for the judge to kind of, um, you know, synthesize all of the information in a short amount of time. Okay, so does anybody have any questions on that? No? Great. Okay. So I will go to a, oh wait, someone has a question. What software is that? Uh, if Jill, you're, you're talking about what I'm using to show the exhibits, it's Foxit Reader. So I use Kovacs to create the portfolio but I use Foxit to view it because as far as I can tell, there's just no easy way to, to view it where all of my exhibits are lined up on the left side. So Jill, if we have another case together and use that against me, I'm going to be really mad. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll show you, this is my slideshow. I just kind of wanted to go through a, a couple of slides of just how I get information in in a, in a short amount of time. Um, and do I click to the next one? one second. Okay, so if you have to do a hearing very quickly on custody and child support, um, I preach you know, introducing exhibits multiple times. I don't know why there's like some urban legend or myth that you have to go through every exhibit painstakingly individually. You just don't. So
So I usually get a group together and say, do you recognize exhibit one as your financial affidavit? Do you recognize exhibit two as your child support worksheet? Do you recognize exhibit three as your pay stubs? They say yes, and you slap those suckers in and keep it moving. Um, so obviously if you have all day, then yeah, you can spend some more time. But I think the most important thing is to get the exhibits in. And then if you run out of time, at least your exhibits are in. So then you can make argument based on them. Um, but if you're time pressed, then don't explain the self-explanatory. If your guy is a manager at Coca-Cola and he's got a pay stub, everybody can read. You don't need to explain it. You only need to explain the things that need explaining. If they're self-employed and you have charts and graphs to support it, if their income recently changed, if they have unexpl unexplained or inflated overtime, you can explain that. But other than that, just get the exhibit in and just move on. Um, so if you know who these people are, then you're probably over 40. If you don't, here's a fun story. So I kind of put this picture up to show where you shouldn't be arguing with a witness. And that's something that took me a long time to learn. So for those that you do not know, this is a picture of Gary Hart and Donna Rice. So Gary Hart was the presumptive presidential nominee for, oh gosh, I think it was the 1984 presidential election. He was going to sail through and win um, until this picture came out. And yeah, it's kind of hard to explain. So if I'm representing, you know, Miss Hart in a divorce case, you put in the exhibit and you move on. You don't argue. Um, because if you start asking, you know, questions, well, what are you doing? Well, you're giving them a chance to defend themselves and say, well, this is just a new Pilates move that we're trying, or it's super innocent. Um, and just really arguing with the witness doesn't really kind of get you anything. So when you are giving your closing argument, you can throw up the picture and you can make all kinds of, um, you know, guesses about what they're doing and point certain things out. Ooh, look at that hand. That hand is intimately placed on her waist. We all know what this is, Your Honor. And look at that, they're clasping hands in a loving manner. So that's an argument thing that you save for closing. It's not something that you need to argue with the witness about. And that's something that took me a really long time to do, because it's really tempting when you get this, what you think is a Matlock moment picture is to argue. And my advice is don't get into the evidence and move on. Um, so here are some tips about preparing your client for the hearing. Tell them how the process is going to work. If it's going to be by Zoom, I always, always, always do a Zoom preparation meeting. I do the exact same thing that we're doing now, which is I go through the exhibits. I run through how we're going to admit the exhibits. I prep them for cross-examination. All of that, tell them how to look you know, professional, at least from the waist up, how to address the court, all of that stuff. Um, I do tell them how to dress. Um, if I think there's, there's an issue that they're going to show up looking not great. How to address the judge and opposing counsel and that means even when you feel like the other attorney is asking you really stupid questions you don't get to be snarky you don't get to roll your eyes you just have to calmly answer the questions as best you can because snarkiness just never anybody. um i ask them to keep their answers short and concise and through the trial prep they should already know what they're going to ask them i ask them to keep focused and on task I give them all the proposed orders and findings ahead of time to review, and I also give them all the exhibits ahead of time. So the worst thing is, you know, when you want this really good piece of evidence to go into evidence and you ask your client, do you recognize this? And they're squinting at the screen like they've never seen it before. Like, that's not what we want. So when we do the trial prep, I go through all the exhibits with them ahead of time so they immediately recognize them and they can immediately say, yes, I recognize this. So the Zoom prep hearing is you, I mean, preparation meeting is usually about an hour. So that usually counts in the hour of my three hours of the preparation um, time. So some of this I've already talked about. This is how I prepare the case for the hearing. I draft a proposed orders. I pre-number the exhibits. If I'm in person, I create a binder for the judge. Going forward, when I go back in person, I'm not gonna have a binder for everybody. I'm absolutely not creating, creating binders from opposing counsel anymore. I'm just gonna email them the Dropbox link and if they wanna kill trees and print it, they can do it themselves. But I think what most people are doing are, is what I'm doing, which is we're bringing our laptops to court. And if they've sent me a Dropbox link, then I can just look at the documents on my computer in court. I don't need to have a paper copy. Um, also label and page number your exhibits. You can do that for in-person as well. So if you digitally add your exhibit sticker, you can just print it with it on there, which saves somebody in your office from going through each exhibit and, and slapping stickers on it, which is not fun. So this is the reason for doing the proposed orders. It helps keep you organized. 
on track drives your case. Um, as I'm doing my preparation for trial, it just it, it allows the client to sort of see how everything is coming together. So, you know, when they think back to three months before when you're harassing them for all of this discovery information, why was this necessary and why do we have to go through all this? Well, this is why, you know, this is what we needed in order to prove our case. So it just kind of helps from, you know, a client management perspective to kind of view all of that information. It helps you remember after the evidence is presented, because sometimes cases will you'll go down some rabbit hole and forget, you know, what you were there for. It just kind of, you know, drives you back on Main Street to sort of focus on that. At the very least, have a proposed finding sheets with broad strokes of what you want, have a client approve. And when I say do the work, what I mean by this is I've seen attorneys come to court with their clients problems and say well this is a highly contested custody case and this is why the other person sucks and this is why i should have custody but they don't have any real solutions so don't just come to court and vomit all of your problems on the court and expect them to come up with a solution for people that they've never met before that day so i like to do the work because i want the judge to look at my order and know that it's reasonable and it lines up with the evidence that i present so i look at the school calendars i look through the work calendars i think through the kids schedule getting home, doing homework. If I'm doing a parenting plan, I make sure that I, I'm not just doing a regular old parenting plan with Christmas. I ask the client, what holidays do they celebrate in case they're um, Jewish or another religion and they, there are other you know, holidays that are important to them. So you just kind of have to make sure that you're you know, communicating with your client ahead of time so you're coming up with something that makes sense for their particular life. Um, also for trial, I'm super big on demonstrative demonstrative exhibits. I give it to the opposing counsel well in advance of the hearing that makes sure that they have plenty of opportunity to review. And this is an example of a really good demonstrative exhibit for me. Um, mom is asking for alimony, attorney's fees, and I think increased child support and a bunch of other crap. So I got all of this information synthesized on one page and it came from bank statements and the bank statements were admitted but you can see here where I put the exhibit that it referenced as well as the page number. And so I get a lot of information packed onto this one little page. And this showed that this is what mom's income was and she was not destitute. And when she felt like working, she made plenty of money. So she doesn't get out money. Oh, eviction. She also complained that my client got her evicted because he refused to pay her rent or something like that. But this is all the money that went into her account before she got evicted. And she got evicted for $4,000. So she had a whole bunch of money and just decided not to pay her rent and then blame it on my client. So this was all something that we could put on one piece of paper. And then she was also also asking for attorney's fees. And the column over oops, column over here. Nope, not that. On the upper right shows where she um, transferred thirty thousand dollars to her family members in Nigeria immediately before asking for attorney's fees. So that was also a big no from the judge. So I also use multiple screen that helps me present my trial. Um, and these are some really quick virtual temporary tips. Use a visual opening statement. I showed you what that looks like in um, in my PDF portfolio, sometimes I use a PowerPoint if I have the time and I'm so inclined that does take a little bit longer, but now I'm just doing a Word document and I'm just including it in my PDF portfolio because frankly it's just easier. Um, this is an example of when I was entirely bored in the beginning of COVID and I decided to do a PowerPoint um, opening statement, which I kind of went through each count. And when and I had this little highlight and everything. This honestly was just doing too much, <laughs> but you can do it. It's kind of impressive, um, and I think the, the court likes visually sort of seeing, and it kind of keeps them on track of what it is that you're asking for. Um, I did talk about this pre-label, pre-number your exhibits. This is an example of how um, you know how specific my my exhibits are are called because it just makes it easier for everybody. Um, that's actually a quick video of how to add the exhibit numbers, which I can send you all later. Consolidate multiple pages onto one page for easy viewing. This, I did it this way on purpose because as you can see, when you zoom out visually, you can see all the green, let's keep doing that, all the green circles versus the red. This was a case where she was accusing him of owing money where he didn't. So it was just really helpful to kind of, you know, have it all on one page because it was 
six different pages of information and I can zoom in and show that the amount owed actually was zero for each thing. So there's kind of another way visually to kind of get in a whole bunch of information in a really short amount of time. Um, we talked about using the PDF portfolio. This is just kind of an example of, of what it looks like. It just makes it easier to just, just zip through each exhibit um, as you go along. Sometimes I, I like to do written closing statements. This is a case that I did where this is what I wanted in the opening. The evidence came out a little bit different than I expected. Um, and some of what the father was asking was reasonable, so I changed it. So when I did my closing, I just kind of edited the edited the slide to show this is what I want in closing. And then I actually did a comparison of this is the opening versus the closing to show the court. I actually listen to the trial, I'm not just here to just tell you what my client wants me to say. I'm here to actually help you make a good decision um, by after listening to the evidence, you know, this is what makes sense. And here's the difference between what I asked for in the opening and what I'm asking for in closing based on how the evidence went. And I think that's pretty persuasive because, you know, at the end of the day, we all we have of our, our, our reputations. So I want, when I walk into a courtroom, I want the judges to be able to say, well, Ms. Edwards doesn't ask for BS or she doesn't ask for anything that's unreasonable. And I know that, you know, her client admits to eight DUIs, you know, in the weeks leading up to trial, she's not gonna say, oh, can I get custody? You know, what I ask for is going to match the evidence. And the more that you do that over and over and over again, just the, it just helps your clients because you just kind of bring a level of credibility when you come to court instead of, well, this attorney is just going to tell me what his client wants and not without any sort of basis behind it. So that's just kind of the wrap up of the PowerPoint. Any questions? It was way quicker than I thought. So I could spend more time on each individual thing, but obviously I just kind of gave you a broad overview of how I prep for trial, but people have always just sort of expressed in credulity when I say that I prepare for trial in like two to three hours, but that's, I really do. And I think part of it is because if you are um, preparing, I see your question, Natalie, uh, answer in a second. If you're preparing for trial all along, um, it just makes it easier. As I go to mediation, I have drafted all these documents anyway. So by the time I go to trial, they've already been drafted and my client's already seen them. Um, and like I said, if you get you know, evidence throughout the case as it's coming in and you know it's a trial exhibit, put it in the trial exhibit folder now before you forget. And it makes it easier as you're preparing for trial. <laughs> Do my clients ever complain about me turning documents over in advance? Do they complain? I would say not really, and also I don't care. So I practice the way that I want to practice, and they hire me because they trust that I know what the heck of it I'm doing. And you know, most times you're not going to get that matlock moment anyway. And you know, it's not you know if you show up in court and you have this great document, and the other side says, "Hey, I haven't seen this before." My experiences in Georgia, you saying, "Well, you didn't ask for it in discovery," it's just not going to win you a lot of points. So I just, I just, you know, hand it over. There's almost nothing that I think that can be rehabilitated a whole lot. Like if I have a picture of you doing lines of cocaine off your kid's forehead, like I don't care if you get it two days before, like can't change what it is. So I just do it. I don't know if my, most of my clients don't complain. If they did, I would just tell them this is the way we do things and just sort of leave it at that. Um, someone asked, what do you suggest when the court wants you to confer with counsel and limit the issues and the other attorney is uncooperative? Um, that happened recently. I proactively reached out to another attorney and said, here's a list of stipulations and he wanted to go back and forth with it and I just gave up. And so I just didn't. So when the trial began, I just put up my list of what I think thought the issues were and what my positions were and what I expected the other side's uh, positions would be. Um, but I just never reached an agreement on it. So I can't control anyone else. I always try um, to, you know, confer with the other side, just even if the court doesn't ask me to, but, you know, some people just don't want to be cooperative and, you know, that's their prerogative.
anybody else have any other questions? Chris, do you have anything you want to add? I don't think so. I was making notes as you were talking, and I think that you covered um, everything that I had noted on here. Um, for the uncooperative opposing counsel, how do you keep a record? Um, meh. It just depends on what it is. I have a pretty high tolerance for shenanigans, to be honest. Um, I think a lot of people get really sort of in their feelings about it. I am a lawyer. I expect people to disagree with me. <laughs> I expect people to not see things my way and not do things the way that I want them to be done. And I, so I don't really get that upset about it. I might mention it a little bit if it's egregious. Other than that, to, than that, to me, it's just sort of typical litigation stuff. And you know, I sort of stay in my lane and I know what I'm doing and where I'm going. And, um, you know, I just let kind of karma take care of the rest. Anybody else any questions? Oh, what I was going to ask you, Krista, is um, so for preparation, how far out do we usually start? Like if we have a full on divorce trial where we are going to be trying every single issue, when do we start doing that? Ideally, I would think like three weeks, if not four, getting all the drafts started, um, making sure the file is organized, the virtual file, um, getting updated documents from opposing counsel. That's not good to leave that to the last minute. Um, getting updated documents from our client, updated pay stubs, income, photos, things like that. And then um, setting the trial prep meeting after we've drafted the documents. The settlement, not the settlement agreement, but the proposed order, child support worksheet, parenting plan, anything like that. So ideally it would be four weeks, but definitely no less than two. Right. Is you work for like five years? Yeah, four and a half, five years. <laughs> so have I ever been like, we have a trial tomorrow, I need you to work till like 10, 11 o'clock at night to get ready? Oh, no. <laughs> no <laughs> so no, we're no. like, super, super proactive. So our trial prep is usually totally complete, like three or four days prior. So there's no last minute stuff. It's just, you know, as long as you just sort of have these systems and then just sort of check it off as you go, there's just no reason for like last minute, you know, putting slapping exhibit stickers on as you're going to the courtroom kind of thing. Cause it, it wouldn't be fair to her to make her, you know, do that last minute. I think it freaks the client out if you're preparing stuff at the last minute and they know it. Um, so just from a, and I'm in family law, which is this, I think the second most has the second most bar complaint. So people like to crap about their family law attorney. So really honestly, to keep people happy, we just kind of make sure that we, um, we, you know, we are transparent about our process and they see everything that we're doing. And I think it just kind of helps because even if we lose and obviously we do lose sometimes they, you don't want them to feel like we lost because you weren't, we weren't prepared or, you know, you didn't put that exhibit into evidence that you were supposed to, like, that just doesn't happen. They know that if they lost, it's, the judge just didn't see it our way, or maybe we just didn't have the evidence or we didn't have the facts, but it's not because we didn't, we weren't able to put the client's best foot forward. I think I don't like unmute people. So does anyone have a question they want to ask orally? I think I can. Oh, yeah. If anyone wants to pop on screen and ask anything, you can. Other than that, I don't think I have that much to add. Okay, cool. So this will be recorded. And as soon as it finishes processing, I will post it to the lawyer on the Beach website. And if you have any questions about specific areas, then go ahead and ask me. Monday.com is a whole different thing. It's probably going to require a whole different webinar based on that. But so those are my trial prep tips. And thanks so much for logging in. And I hope everybody has a good day. See ya.